Hello friends, this is Christopher Davis Shannon, and today we're hopping across the pond, yet again where it seems most of the ukulele players are, um, to talk to the wonderful Tara Maisie over in England. Tara, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you Christopher, how are you? I'm doing splendidly, it's so nice to see you. We're, we're actually having like a London morning here, it is so grey and overcast and terrible. Oh well, I don't, we're having a lovely, we've got that lovely autumnal blue sky, really crisp. You took it. You took that from us, and that's unfair. Yeah, sorry about that. I'll, I'll throw it back your way. <laughs> well, so Tara is the, the founder of the London Ukulele Project, and we're going to talk about that in just one moment. But first, would you mind starting us off with a song? Okay, so this is a bit cliche on the ukulele, but I love working with young people. And also, I work for a charity called Age UK, and this is always a really popular song with them. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are grey. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't tell. Other night, dear, whilst I lay sleeping, I dreamt I held you in my arms. When I awoke, dear, I was mistaken, and I held down my head and I cried. You are my son. All right, so as I mentioned before the tune, Tara founded the London Ukulele Project. What is the London Ukulele Project? <laughs> so the London Ukulele Project um, is a not-for-profit organization that, so I'm a CIC, um, that has a mission to combat loneliness. So all of our profits, um, go towards donating ukuleles to schools and community groups. That was my email. Do you want me to turn that on? Sorry. That's How okay. do I do that? I turn that off. This is going to ping every two seconds. Um, so, yeah, so our mission is to support schools and community groups, teachers to um, take the ukulele into their community, use it more as a tool for bringing people together. So, um, yeah, it started as the London Ukulele Project and then it's, it's sort of grown in, over the last couple of years. I realised in, I think it was around May, that I was running this on my own pretty much. Um, and it was quite isolating, which was the irony of you know, yeah. <laughs> something. <laughs> so um, I teamed up with a fellow teacher who's in Glasgow and she founded the Scotland Ukulele Project. And now we have a Wales Ukulele Project. And we've also got two more in the pipeline, which hopefully nice. we'll be able to um, confirm over the next couple of weeks. But it's the idea is to have all the 12 regions to have a ukulele project. And we work together, but we also do our own thing so i my specialty is early years and um i work with age uk um was was where the inspiration came from which is age uk as a charity um that supports people in older life so uh, like later mm -hmm. life um so we 
that's where the inspiration came from because I was asked to run a class and it was hugely popular and the feedback that came back were things like I feel less isolated, I feel more confident, um, I've made great friends. I mean, I could go on and on for a long time about it, but um, we have an MP for loneliness in the UK currently. Um, she was appointed in 2017. So like, this is not for loneliness. This is one of those things where I go, that would never happen in America. <laughs> yeah, so, because when I talk about loneliness, people think that maybe I set it up during the pandemic because we right. all experience yeah. isolation. But loneliness has been a problem way before the pandemic. Absolutely. And, and thank God you, you all were around during the pandemic, because I mean, this is certainly a time when no one can congregate, no one can do anything, you know, bringing people together through music is such such a beautiful thing. Yes, but I mean, it was, there were just so many, I mean, how wonderful is the ukulele community? There were so many people that yeah, gave yeah. up their time to, you know, host Zoom meetings and, um, I mean, wonderful things. We tried our best to, my husband's a sound engineer, so he lost, you know, all of his work overnight. So unfortunately I had to take on lots more teaching because that's what pays me. Um, and I was lucky to be able to do that, but it meant that I could give less time to the project, but we did do a collaboration, didn't we did with a little help from my friends. And then we did Jingle Bell Rocks, which you were amazing on. And um, that raised money for various things. So the, with a little help from my friends, raised money for the, um, help musicians, which supported not only musicians, but sound engineers, anyone that worked basically in the music industry, and also for the NHS charities together. And then the Jingle Bell Rocks was for the Trussell Trust, um, which is a food bank. So we also, the Ukulele Project also wants to help so, sort of give ideas and inspiration and support into people using the ukulele to be able to raise money for other things that they feel passionate about as well. So um, Sarah is working very closely with the LGBT health and well-being in Glasgow. You know, that's a very isolated group, especially older people within that community. Um, and, you know, and then, like I said, I work with Age UK Richmond here in London. In Wales, um, it's run by Sean Keddy and he's done an amazing amount of work like over the pandemic with my Steg ukulele club mm -hmm. and he will approach it in a different way because Wales is much more rural. So, um, you know, he's doing a lot more online things. So I like that we're all sort of adding our own little thing, but we're all working together, which is nice. And yeah. And you're, and you're helping out so many different people along the way as well you know as you're saying it's all these different charities that you're able to donate to and yeah so we're we're very much about not running the classes ourselves but running them for we don't want to set up a ukulele project club we want to work in partnership with a community group so that they can set up a club right right so, so using age uk as an example we donate the ukuleles to them so that they can run a, a beginner's course and then they can charge their clients a small fee to join the course which then covers the wage of a tutor which we can then provide to them and then you know at the end we encourage like a performance so we're doing in december hopefully covid permitting we're doing a performance where we invite their friends and family to come and you know watch them play but they'll pay you know money to come and do that and then it all comes around you know back to the charity again so it's a way of them not only fulfilling their role of bringing people together but it's also raising money so it ticks a lot of boxes i think and it yes indeed and and i mean just from everything you're telling me it's incredible that you do so much of this yourself <laughs> i mean i know you have a, a network now of folks helping you out across the UK. Everyone say hi to Charlie and goodbye hey, to Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, um, yeah, I mean, I have been doing it on my own. I mean, I had incredible support at the beginning from um, Mary Agnes Creel of 
certainly ran yeah. all the new daily festival she was a huge inspiration she helped me with my first grant application and i mean the work that she does is incredible and um you know i'll be forever grateful to her but um yeah I'm, I'd reach <laughs> reaching out to more people to help um so yeah if there's anyone watching that wants to volunteer or get involved then do yeah, get in uh, touch do it and um, i ask you tara an odd question why the why the ukulele as the instrument why not the london guitar project or the london didgeridoo project well that's a very good question well <laughs> for anyone that plays the ukulele you know it's the accessibility it's affordable i think ukulele players are just so kind aren't they and they so agreed on that yeah i mean i'm not biased at all but <laughs> yeah. um but also so willing to give time and i think that's what really struck me when i first took up the ukulele and um i ran a workshop with sarah mazel and craig chi and i was so lucky that they came to the music shop where i worked and they were just i mean unbelievable they you know we were a community ukulele group playing at a farmer's market and they just got stuck in and started playing with us and yeah they, they are just two of the kindest and, then, and most wonderful people i think <laughs> <laughs> and then they just said, you know, here, have, I, I literally felt like they were going to give me the coats off their back almost. It was like, here, have, you know, and, and someone would say, how did you do that? And they were so happy to share that. And I think if you went, you know, went to any other musician, this may be a bit mean in general, but they might. <laughs> Let it out, be me. <laughs> they might not want to share as quite in the same way that the ukulele community does. I, I actually, I absolutely agree with that because you know, like I play a host of instruments and in a lot of different scenes and there's there's something very special about the the ukulele world that yeah. the rest of music doesn't and, and, and a lot of it are things that I wish the rest of the music world had like the huge sense of community in the the ukulele world. You know, there aren't guitar players getting together every week to play, you know, their favorite tunes and strum them together and just sing them as a group at a pub to have fun and try. Yeah, and I think there's just there's very little ego, I think, isn't it? In, you know, Absolutely. People... Yeah. And that's a beautiful and, and I would that there's so much you can do on ukulele, but you can you can also just be up and running in a matter of minutes. And well, it's exactly. an amazing feeling, you know, to play those <laughs> first few chords. I work with with beginner students or do like um, beginner work, like group classes and workshops. It's so nice to see the light on people's face when they play like, even their first C major chord. And like yeah. this simple thing I just did, it's music already, where <laughs> you don't always have that accessibility, feeling. you know? I love that. When I, when I start a, when I first, you know, start a beginner's group, I always go around the room and say, you know, what would you like to achieve? And it's so, I just love that feeling. Don't you love when you say, they say something like, Oh, well, I'd like to, you know, at the end of the six weeks, be able to play one song. I was like, we got Here you covered go. today on that. <laughs> Ten minutes later, there's yeah. a song. I mean, it might be Row Row Your Boat, but it's still a song. But it's something. Yeah, I was doing a, uh, a beginner group um, workshop actually last Monday. And, and we did, we got through two tunes in the entire thing, including like a simple little chord melody thing. Yeah. And the one person's mind was like blown. I'm like, see, it's a, you can make beautiful music on this thing without too much effort <laughs> or knowledge. It really is. And I think, I mean, you were incredibly kind. You came along to one of the AGK classes. And oh, that was a blast. It. Yeah. <laughs> saw it in action. Um, but, you know, a lot of those people, like, there was a lady who's um, in her eight, early 80s and she said um, that at school she was told to get to the back of the room and, you know, that she was not musical at all. And now she's playing. I remember, yeah. She's playing beautiful melodies and and also you know i have i hope she doesn't mind me like pinpointing her out but she has arthritis as well and she's able to adapt you know the ukulele to work for her like you know it doesn't matter if you're not playing an e minor play an e minor seven instead you know it, it's a way of making it much more accessible to to different absolutely yeah and i do to say tara's ukulele group um you guys should be careful of them. They're one of the really good ones. They're working oh, on multi-part, uh, like solo pieces with a few different parts in there. In addition to the strumming stuff, I was I was floored because it was it was so. And you weren't doing like really easy repertoire that most people do, as well. You were throwing them. I feel a lot of like 
curveballs, not not just basic three chord songs. And they were knocking it out of the park and having so much fun with them, uh, even though well, it was a little bit Yeah, they've been very loyal. They're, um, but I mean, that's what's come out is the, the friendship. We'd had a, a sort of, um, we, we got to a slightly difficult point that they are getting very, very good. The, and it's tough in a youth group, right? <laughs> it's everyone's yeah. going to be on the same level. Well, it's hard because then there's if we want to get new people involved, they feel a bit intimidated to join. Yeah. So it's quite, we're at a sort of tricky crossroad. I think also because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to run so many beginners classes this year. So, yeah. um, but we did a sort of beginners thing, and it was so lovely. I mean, this is an example of the ukulele community. You know, a group of people took time out of their day to come and support some beginners because they wanted to let them know that actually they shouldn't be worried if they can't get that D minor chord straight away or they find the strumming difficult. And they came and they supported this new group and it was so lovely. And we actually spent the time to sort of go around and individually said what they found hard and what they found easy about it. And, or, you know, a, a negative and a positive and, everything was the negative was you know that they all that they wanted to get better sure quicker <laughs> don't we all right but yeah if you but, find that uh, secret let me know <laughs> yeah well practice though this is this was a myth yeah, is that it is that the secret well you obviously have to have <laughs> natural talent such as yourself does help but practice helps practice. a lot more though <laughs> And um, but it was so lovely and all the positive was all that they they had this friendship. And there was a lady that hadn't been for a while because she's had, you know, life's got in the way and there's been you know, a few dramas and she was nervous to come back to the full group. And so she came to this beginners and she she sort of almost had tears in her eyes saying, you know, I realized that we're a family. And I mean, it's so moving. I feel like my my son is six. I feel like he has a huge amount of grandparents, you know, that are <laughs> looking out for him. And it's so lovely. And I love that. And then I, I'm so lucky because I have that. And then the next day I go and work in a classroom with a group of four year olds, <laughs> you know, so I get the contrast of all these different ages. And, and again, the four year olds, I love it's building confidence. It's giving them ownership over something. They're not just. Yeah. You know, as it, it, it just, just Right. to show you know no matter where you're at in your in your life like music can can help you so much whether whether you're someone that's been retired for 10 years and want a new hobby or whether you're a young child you know there's something that we all have to learn from from even just picking up the ukulele and playing a little yeah, bit. Really and i i love how though people you know it's, it's also learning lessons such as you know motivation and um sticking to something yeah you know, it's a long process like eric clapton still practices i'm sure like he doesn't you know it's it's an ongoing thing isn't it being a musician yeah. oh it never it's stops never <laughs> if you stopped. ever think that you've gotten good enough at an instrument i think you failed <laughs> at that point yeah <laughs> yeah you, feel you can find that you're like i'm here i can stop practicing <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so i think that's what i love about the ukulele especially is i think there's just so much room, isn't there? You can yeah, join in and be just very happy playing some very, you know, some great chords, or you can become a virtuoso, you know, there's... Yeah, and there's so much in between and everyone kind of finds their own path and that's sort of the beauty of it. I love watching beginner students kind of all start in, in the same place and then just diverge and go off where they want to and learn their their musical and ukulele world over yeah, the years. And it's really wonderful to watch people grow like that, you know. Um, so Tara, would you mind playing us another tune before we uh, we dive into chatting a bit more? I'd be delighted to. So this is a song from the book First Ukulele Pieces, and it was contributed by Elizabeth Pfeiffer, who is a friend of mine, and it was very, very sweet and called it Tara's song.
And that was Tara's song from a new book by the London Ukulele Project. But before you tell us about the book, I actually have a question. Yes. Can you tell us about the zebras behind you? What? <laughs> okay. So, oh God. So during lockdown, um, my husband is a comms and sound engineer. I met, did I mention this already? He lost like all his work overnight and um, it was all very stressful. And um, my parents were also moving house and, oh, it's a really long story, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> zebra, my... Every zebra painting should have a long story. No, I've never met one. Long story. Anyway, so my, I don't know how far to go back in this. I basically bought it during <laughs> lockdown when we had absolutely no money. And I thought, why not get a zebra picture? Of course. But I, but I it's... <laughs> It's more than like, embarrassing, but it um, reminds me slightly of the Beatles because of their hairstyles. Can you oh, see? I couldn't see the hair because it was it was just cut off right where the hairline yeah. was. They're Beatles hairstyles, and um, we we did you know with a little help from my friends, so we thought that was, and I just it made me so happy. And it's my cousin in Australia, They're not actually together anymore, so she's not really my cousin anymore, but. She painted it. So it came all the way from Australia during lockdown. That's wild. Yo, I have a painting on my wall that was it was my aunt's ex-boyfriends from like the 80s. It's this floating hamster that I have. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> it's a, well, yeah, th th that's the reason I ask about POYC, like odd artwork such as zebras. <laughs> I yeah. need to know the story because I feel like all good paintings have a good story behind them. No one just goes to Ikea and buys that. Uh, so I would so say, I will tell you the long story. So my mum, when I was nine, worked, got offered a job and worked for Elton John. <laughs> no big deal. No big deal. Just that, that little person. And um, he, um, and with some, some money that she'd, saved working for him whilst working for him she bought this ridiculous table <laughs> that was called the elton john table <laughs> and it was something that i absolutely loved and it was such a big part of my childhood like i used to get up at five o'clock in the morning to go to the flower markets so that we could then go to his house um before school and anyway it was you know that was my primary school years and so she um, said that I would always be given this table, but we live in a tiny flat. And I mean, we're very, very lucky, but it's a small flat and we have chosen to do a career that we love rather than something that's gonna make us a lot of money. <laughs> and we just decided that there was never gonna be enough room for this ridiculous uh, table. Yeah. And so my brother, my stepbrother does have a very nice big house and he, offered to buy it off me so that is also why i went for this painting because i thought it was just very flamboyant and i didn't want to spend the money on like bills and council tax yeah and so in reality elton john bought you this painting so actually skip a couple that is of the threes. better story let's edit out the waffle <laughs> ask me a question again christopher where did, okay. get... Sorry, where did this painting come from well, behind you? elton john bought it for me there we go that's the one <laughs> <laughs> that's the story we'll be telling the grandchildren <laughs> yes yeah you, well now you get to pass this this zebra painting on through the family that's that's the key and the story can just keep evolving over the years yeah and it will get more and more elaborate and, and eventually more... elton john will have painted it himself yeah and gifted it to your mother. <laughs> yeah, he would have painted it using only his mouth or something like. <laughs> no, yeah, he put he put paint on the hammers of a piano and painted zebras that's, that's by it. by playing a song. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, sorry, did we go on a tangent again? This we happened. Did, yeah. Oh, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but it brings me great joy, and that's what life should be all about, isn't it? A absolutely, absolutely. And if that joy comes through zebra paintings. More well, I would much rather power. give my money to the zebra painter than um, Boris Johnson. So there you go. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of not Boris Johnson, so you just had the London Ukulele Project just had a book come out that has nothing to do with Boris Johnson at all. But could you <laughs> tell us about the new book? <laughs> oh, so we are so honestly just so overwhelmed by this book because it's just a beautiful story. <laughs> so I was very. Um, 
I was very lucky to be invited to speak with Paul Mansell on his ukulele podcast. And um, we were chatting about the ukulele project and it was following Heidi Swedberg and Daniel Ward coming and doing some work for us. And Heidi was just is just an amazing champion of what we're doing and she's just incredible. That's a helicopter going over my house. <laughs> what we're about to um, and we were chatting to Paul and I said, wouldn't it be great to get a whole of like, people together? And, um, you know, Matt was home at the time during the pandemic and we thought, you know, maybe he could, we could do an album or something. And then Paul, we sort of sat on that idea and then Paul said, well, why don't we do a book? Why don't we, instead of getting artists to play, why don't we come up with uh, a book so we invite we asked a handful of people that we um love and admire to contribute a piece and the remit was um that it was a beginner's melody beginner intermediate melody and that it fit on a page <laughs> and that it reflected the the seven emotions somehow because everything that we're doing at the ukulele project is linked to well-being and we're trying to promote you know happiness and um so it was reflecting those and it's just so lovely and i was just we were blown away by the amount of people that said yes 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 we'd, we'd like to get involved and you know yeah, we, and thought we should we should note these are not just just some casual players the road to you you have people such as james hill jim beloff samantha muir i mean you yeah. the list of people that are in this book is is incredible yeah i mean we've got giovanni albini tony mizzen we've got colin tribe i mean yeah the a-list yeah yeah we've got christopher davis shannon i mean never heard of the guy amazing <laughs> and so we thought that we'd have i don't know maybe 10 pieces or something we thought but it turned into i think we've got 35 <laughs> and and this is what it looks like here it is and it's real and it exists and it's real and ah oh, just love it so much and we had this um yeah i mean just and so paul put, put it all together did like tabbed up all the music so that it all looked the same um, which my, would have taken me about a million years. So I'm very glad to hear that. And um, yeah, I mean, it's totally Paul's sort of break. I, I just did the, I just did the sort of a, a more of a sort of design eye. I was, so I put all the pieces like in a PDF and sent it off. Um, but it's, it's beautiful. And I, and I think people are really pleased. I think that it's had some great feedback so far, but um it's the, I think you say Lee, Leho ukuleles design the, the mm -hmm. cover and they didn't want, we, you know, we were saying, put your logo in and they didn't want to do that. So we're giving a shout out to them again for doing that. Yeah, that was very good. Cause yeah, honestly, well, how, well, how beautiful is that cover? <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, but there are so many, and we tried to put them into order of what we thought was sort of easiest to, mm hardest so you'll see Christopher your piece is quite near the back <laughs> I, think, I think I told Paul I had to rewrite it three times because I'd get <laughs> to the end I'd be like this is a great idea I'd go, no I, I'm gonna be the only one that plays that <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean literally the last piece um, is I mean I it looks very overwhelming to me. Yeah, who got who? Who's is the last one? I'm just curious. Who who dared write the hardest one? So it's Fabrizio Nastari. Ah, and there's a lot of hammer ons and some quite tricky. No, I have to, the piece I wrote for this uh, actually got written because of a Facebook comment from Matt Stead. That's that's so why I wrote this piece. <laughs> I, I would love to, what was the inspiration behind your piece? Someone had posted, it, it was on one of the Facebook ukulele groups. And you know, like sometimes I'll be able to hop on, like help people out, like beginners having questions and stuff. And Matt does some very similar things. And someone had posted a picture of it. It goes, what is this chord that's on here? And it was, um, that it was open three, one, oh, four, one or something. It was something really weird that had a G 
G and a G sharp integrated in the chord. And after all this going back and forth with the person who posted it, it ended up that you're just not supposed to play the G string on it, and it, it was in E chord, I think. Like, that's, that's that's all it actually was. But this whole thing was people trying to name a chord that had this half-step dissonance in it. Okay. <laughs> so I wrote this whole, so I wrote the whole piece with, with thirds that just go back and forth between major and minor, the entire thing, so it never really settles on tonality because this well, is what you do for beginner books but it was <laughs> but I, I was i was talking to matt on the thread and him and we have our back and forth and i was like you know i should write a piece off of this i was like i have a good opportunity to do it right now <laughs> yeah oh well it's it's a really beautiful piece and we're so grateful because all um most of the artists have also not only contributed the book but they've they've done a video as well which you can watch on our website and um, you've also, Guy, you've just been so amazing at, you know, promoting it on your channels and on your pages. So we're yeah, very and I'm going to link down below in the description of this so that people can go to the website and hear all the pieces. And is is the book available directly for sale now on the the London U yeah. website? Because I know it was yeah. pre order for a while. Yeah, so so it was it was a a pre order project, but then um, it's now available to order. But we don't have very many left of this limited edition. This is so a good problem to have, right? <laughs> good problem to have. So we only we've done a two hundred run of this limited edition. Um, so they're each, you know, I numbered each book. So um, we're on the seventeenth of October. We're doing a, a, we're having a party, and we're going to give away the two hundredth copy. It will say 200. And that's, and that's a live online party, right? Yeah, yes. So everyone um, can tune in. Everyone can tune in on, on YouTube. And then um, our patrons are going to come and uh, join us in Zoom. So, yeah, because we have this, we have a resource. So we have lots of people that help us um, support us month by giving a monthly donation. And then it's, it's like Patreon, but we just do it through our own website. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, and the, but but the idea is then following on from this limited edition, we're just gonna we're gonna split the book into two, mm -hmm. um, because we felt that um, originally we were gonna just take some of the pieces out, but we really love the whole thing. We just think every piece is absolutely beautiful, and honestly, not just they are, they are all stunning. Um, and also, we thought by splitting it into two, it makes it more affordable for students. Mm. Because I, so I also teach piano and, you know, there's a series of books that I use and they go from one color to the next and to the next to the next. And I just feel like there isn't really anything like that in the ukulele. There's not, but there, you know, and it's actually one of the reasons that I'm so happy about this book coming out is that it's all these new beginner pieces, for yeah. ukulele, which it's, there's so many ukulele books on the market, but not a lot of them are really geared at that and and new works as well not just rearrangements of old yes, folk so tunes new works. And also, i love seeing these new pieces coming out and it's pieces that people can work to you know work through rather than i don't know maybe choosing one or two from the book and then and there's yeah. and i know from playing through um paul's piece that's it simple things that's in there like that's something that i could throw at someone a month into their ukulele journey and yes. they could play a solo piece and be just so happy about that, <laughs> you know, and having pieces that are that accessible, I think is so important for, for education because- But I think also that the, the um, I mean, I love, obviously this may be controversial because there's, there's so many free resources and that's amazing. And that's, you know, part of its accessibility and the willingness to share and things. But I think as a teacher, I would rather be able to, to say to my student, I'd like you to go and buy this book and we'll work through it. Absolutely. Rather than just give them something that I've downloaded off the internet. I mean, I just, cause it's not only is it giving them something actually, I mean, even if it was a downloadable PDF, but whatever it's, yeah. I think it's giving them something tangible that they can hold and work through and. Right. You know, and you can track your progress through it. It's not just learning random pieces. And I think that's a whole, a lot of us fall into when we're starting out on the intros. There's so much out there you can find 
tabs and arrangements for anything your heart desires in the world. And then you end up with a, a three inch binder of sheets that you've printed out and you forget to ever play any of them. <laughs> I know. And, I, and that's so easy to, and I totally, and I mean, that's what we're hopefully doing with our resource as well is that have having more a, a sort of step by step. So like I said, I, you know, I specialize in early years. So I, I teach um, and then the school that I'm in currently, it's the first year of school. So there are only five turning six. Mm. Um, and so I've got, you know, a kid's book that I do, which has a sort of step by step, but includes also things like researching artists. And we've had some guest arrangements that like you have very kindly donated some pieces for the book but for the resource sorry not yeah, just yeah. the resource as well and um that's what we want to sort of grow and expand on but because we want to support artists such as yourself as well like you know you are very talented and work hard and need to be rewarded for that well thank you <laughs> we all appreciate that we want um, a champion and i also you know i as a mother i want my son to know that he can have a career being an artist and not have to yeah retrain as something else but it's yeah and that's a, <laughs> a current predicament in the uk right just retrain the artists they can do something else <laughs> yeah so i'm referring to an advert our lovely government potential. yes i know <laughs> a ballerina saying fatima can retrain so yeah it's, it's like, <laughs> yeah, and there, and I mean, and I, I think it's going away a little bit the the stigmatization of making a living in the arts. Like it's becoming a little bit more accepted, and I thank the online world for that. People realizing that you know, working artists are not just famous people touring the world every day, <laughs> making millions of dollars. There's actually a lot of people out there, and the vast majority of musicians that are just just normal people that happen to play music or, yeah. or paint for a living or do something like that. There's nothing there's nothing weirder about that than being a train conductor to me, yeah, exactly. which is also a cool job. I'd be a, yeah, I'd be yeah. a train conductor. Nice hats. It's also, you know, from a therapy, you know, music therapy is such an important yeah. job. And, you know, to be a music therapist, certainly with like, um, there's a leading music therapy um school called Nordoff Robbins um and that's what I grew up my godfather was the founding director of Nordoff Robbins so that's I grew up knowing that music was used for therapy and so it's always been on my radar but you know to be a Nordoff Robbins music therapist you have to have a psychology degree and you have to have a grade eight in an instrument so you know, serious stuff. It's not just it's, uh, yeah. Because over here, most places you you need at least a master's graduate degree yeah. to do you know, music therapy, and that's that's tough for a lot of people to get to, especially financially in the states. But, yeah, exactly. The finances is a huge thing. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, we could go on for hours about the state of the world, but yeah. yeah yes, but we'll <laughs> we'll stick the we'll we'll, we'll put the political. <laughs> Uh, speech, <laughs> but that's okay. But how about how about we uh, we we play another song instead? How about that? <laughs> Great idea, <laughs> Christopher. Well, will you play your song? Thank you so much for taking the time out of your afternoon to join me today and chat about music and the London Ukulele Project. And for everyone listening, I'm going to link below to the London Ukulele Project, how you can get a copy of the book and support them and follow all of the wonderful work that they're doing in the future. So again, Tara, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure and a huge honor to be on your podcast, Christopher. So happy to have you here. And if you wouldn't mind, could you just play us a little bit of exit music?
I will, I'll do a little bit of um a little bit of exit music. Buckets of rain, buckets of tears, got all them buckets going out of my ears, buckets of moonbeams in my hands. You've got